Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we learn from those doing good in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the world, why they care, what we can do, and most importantly, what you can do. All right. <laughs> uh, Pod for Good is produced and edited by Ranag Productions, which is me. So if you like how we sound and are thinking about starting a podcast, reach out to me. I'm easy to find. Pod for Good can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. So please make sure to subscribe and share this episode on social media or, you know, God willing, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We still don't have a new one. I am your chief philanthropod and class clown mini version of the Tulsa Driller in France, Jesse Ulrich. And I am your vice admiral philanthropod and your class clown for justice, BCE, Chris Miller. Nice. In this episode, we are talking with Michelle Place, executive director of the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum. We talked to Michelle about the importance of telling more than just happy history, the story of the French golden driller, and the profound impact of a little-known Tulsan named Jane Hurd Clinton. Enjoy. Michelle, thank you for joining us on Pot for Good today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. We are actually here in your office at the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum. Exciting. A non-remote interview. Yeah. Uh, so pleased to have you here. And yes, isn't this a lovely space that I get to work in? You do really have a is. nice view of a very pretty part of town. I do. So, I do. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the garden the, center. Right there. Yeah, I think that's the largest magnolia in the state of Oklahoma, possibly. Oh, wow. All right. Did not know that. Mm-hmm. That's what we knew today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know that's what that is. So I knew <laughs> it was a tree. So but. I know I picked the wrong spot. I'm just looking at a wall. Yeah. With no artwork. No. <laughs> okay. But you know what temperature it is in here. Exactly. So that's, true. that's good. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing about working in a museum because we keep the temperature at 68 degrees and mm. the humidity levels mm-hmm. at a constant. So my threshold is about 92. I uh, do not like hot weather mm-hmm. at all. <laughs> So uh, just full disclosure, I am on the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum uh, board. And, but one of the reasons I'm on that board is because I love history and I love watching, like I enjoy learning history myself, but I also enjoy watching other people learn about it. And in Oklahoma and Tulsa, especially we have, we have a, I think. Complicated. Yeah. Complicated, unique (laughs) uh, historical issues. And that we, there's a side that wants to have a lot of pride about one particular storyline of Oklahoma history. And it's that that group is also not the one that d- doesn't really want to explore the other part of uh, Telson, Oklahoma's history. So I think we'll start there because what's amazing to me is that the largest collection of pictures about the 1921 Tulsa race massacre live here. Correct. Correct. We do have the largest collection. Um, I have been working at the Tulsa Historical Society, not museum at the time. Uh, I began in 2001, and it was about a month after the state of Oklahoma's commissioned um, report on, at the time we called it, the race riot. One of our volunteers, longtime volunteers, who um, had served on that commission, walks into my office, I'd only been here a couple of weeks, and dropped, literally dropped on my desk, a cardboard box. And he said, these are research materials that the commission used for the 1921 Tulsa race mass uh, riot. It's the most important collection that you have. Guard it with your life. Um, I'm sure I was stunned. And he basically said, good day, and walked off. So I began to look inside the box, and I will tell you that I could not get through the whole box. It took me days and days to do that. Fortunately, um, well... I am from Little Rock, and I was born September of 1957 um, in the midst of the Little Rock Nine and the integration of Little Rock Public Schools. My aunt was a student there. My father had graduated a few years before, and we all knew about the integration of 
Little Rock Public Schools. We went to church with Governor Faubus. He sat on usually on the other end of our pew or one right behind us. And so that was just always um, something that I knew. The winds also blew me in um, other areas of knowing about race relations because my father was the commissioner of all of the NAI schools in the state of Arkansas. And so even though I was a child, I was aware of integration of college athletics because that was part of his job. Then um, in the fifth grade, my mother, my grandmother was a private duty nurse in Memphis. And she was at the hospital when the garbage workers who had been injured and subsequently died uh, were brought to the hospital. And then Martin Luther King comes to town. So my parents took my brother and I into Memphis to be with my grandmother. She was getting police escorts home every night, blah, blah, blah. So we're driving around Memphis waiting for my grandmother to get off work. And we... um all of a sudden hear all of these sirens and we think, well, let's just go on and go to granny's house. And so we go in, we turn on the television and that's when we learned that Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot. And then my parents are horror stricken because we had just driven by the Lorraine Motel about 10 or 15 minutes before he was shot. So again, that's another area I was in the fifth grade, so I'm very aware of it then. It was personal. Then the newest junior high literally was at the end of my street. I had looked forward to going there my ninth grade year. Suddenly, must have been my father who broke the news to me that I would not be going to that junior high at the end of my street, that I would be getting on a bus and going all the way across Little Rock to what had been the black high school. It was Horace Mann. Uh, let's just say nobody was happy. The teachers weren't happy. The students weren't happy. I mean, it was a very, very difficult time and coming of age, if you will. And then when I got to the 10th grade, um, the high school that we went to was back normal. I mean, in the white side of town, it was the black kids who were bussed over to us. So so having had all of these experiences and living in Tulsa for 15 years, I come to work for Clayton Vaughn, who is a retired news broadcaster, um, to this rundown mansion with black mold, asbestos, leaking roof, flooding basements. I sit on a folding chair that literally he had gotten out of the dumpster. That's what I was sitting on. We both kept on our full-length coats and gloves, and I walked out with the job. And so now this incident happens a couple of weeks after I've been there. I've made it through the box, realizing what we have and the magnitude of it. And then I get a phone call, answered it, and it was a reporter from New Zealand who wanted to know about the Tulsa race riot. Well, my mind immediately went to 1968 because it was certainly a year of turmoil across the country. And it was before internet, before we had cell phones. And so I asked him if he would call me back in a couple of hours because I wanted to find the right person for him to get information from. He agreed. We hung up. I turned to Clayton. I tell him, and Clayton looks at me and he says, you don't know, do you? And I'm like, well, obviously not. And so Clayton is the one who told me about the about the race riot. And I guess it was after that then that the the volunteer had brought in the box of photographs. I have my timeline a little confused right there. But it was so shocking to me to live in a community for 15 years to have had this type of event and nobody wants to talk about it. And um, the people who had started the Tulsa Historical Society, I believe at the time that what they really wanted to do was to talk about Tulsa as the oil capital of the world. 
and to celebrate those companies and then to um, perpetuate the good family names of everyone who had been involved in the oil industry. Um, So it was easier for me to understand why the white community did not want to talk about it. Because the bottom line is, these are felonies that have been committed on a huge scale. And none of us want to think that it was our grandfathers, our uncles, our cousins, whoever, who would have perpetuated and participated in um, that kind of horrific story. But what really becomes curious to me, why don't Why doesn't the Black community talk about it? So I struggled with that for quite a a while. And through the course of my work, um, I began to... um, So um, Clayton retired in 2006. He had told me when I interviewed that he was going to retire. He just didn't say when. And he wanted me to take the executive director job, and I knew that I was not ready for it and that it would be disastrous for both the institution and for me. And so we hired a wonderful, wonderful person, um, Sharon Terry, who was very um, knowledgeable about best board practices, policies, procedures, all of those things, and and board development. Um, And she did a great job. But then she also came to retirement six uh, years later. So in 2012, and that's a whole nother story, uh, I became the executive director. And at the time, um, we had a staff of six who all have very distinct jobs. And we committed to one another that we were going to tell all of Tulsa's stories, not just that oil capital of the world story. We wanted to know about roustabouts. Uh, We also wanted to know about our minority communities, which were really beginning to come to the forefront with immigration on a larger scale. Um, And so they were a part of Tulsa too. So we wanted to tell that. We knew through museum practices that minority populations do not trust majority populations with their stories. Okay. Well, if you're going to tell those stories, how are you going to get them? Because they, minorities are not going to come to you. Okay. That's easy. I, as the executive director, have to be present and participate and show up in the North Tulsa community. So that's what I said about doing and building um, relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was at a Uh, I believe it was a John Hope Franklin symposium, breakout session, small group. And I sat next to this wonderful um, woman, this beautiful countenance. And we began chatting and her name was Brenda Nails Alford. Lo and behold, she is a descendant of a race massacre survivor. And we just began to chat and all. And so through our friendship um, and trust, That was the question of why didn't the Black community talk about 1921 Tulsa race riot still at the time? And she got this blank look on her face and she said, I don't know. And so at the next family dinner, her family um, had that discussion. And it was really interesting what she came back and told me. There were several factors. Um, Number one, was that if it happened once, it could happen again. And so there was that fear. But the Black community wanted to instill in future generations the idea that they could achieve anything that they wanted. And they didn't want the least bit of hindrance or any possibility that things that their dreams could not come true. And so that was also a reason not to talk about it. But we also know now about PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. So these elders of the community certainly had that. 
and that element of fear. So it was a number of of reasons that they didn't want to talk about it um, then. But I would say that that attitude has drastically changed for the good in the last few years. Well, and I'm curious your opinion on it. I think it's interesting that the way that the Tulsa Race Massacre kind of became well-known across the country and across the world largely is because of a couple of different shows on HBO, Watchmen and uh, Lovecraft Country, which are both one sort of a horror show, one sort of a science Futuristic, fiction, yeah. fantasy, yeah. superhero yeah. type thing. Also horror. Also yeah. horror. <laughs> you know, and so the the fact that it was pop culture that brought this, that created the conversation when people wouldn't have it in more of an academic Correct. Standpoint. So I, I'm curious what you thought about that. Yeah. Well, let me begin by saying um, that opening scene in, in Watchmen is pretty spot on as much as I can imagine from what I've read, the oral histories that I've heard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I absolutely agree that it was those things that gave us a broader answer uh, or, or exposure. However, There were many of us, I would say, even as early as certainly 2015, that were well aware that the 100th anniversary was coming up and we needed to get ready uh, because the world was going to be on Tulsa. And I believed that from the very beginning. Maybe it's my experience from Little Rock integration that I realize how far that story can go. So there were all kinds of commissions and committees and all. And then um, with this collection that the Tulsa Historical Society had gotten, and I will tell you, I have no idea how Dick Warner obtained the collection that we have today, but I made Dick a promise that I would care for that collection with my life. And so as technology progressed, Um, The staff members here were absolutely eager to um, um, bring in technology, you know, that we would make it available. And I still don't think we realized how far and wide that was going to go. We also didn't really realize that how many hits that we would get. We, the staff, made a commitment that we were not going to hold anything back that had to do with Black Wall Street, Greenwood, the Tulsa Race Massacre, North Tulsa. We were going to hold nothing back because I wanted to be able to say globally, because now we're going to put it out there on the website, to say we are holding no secrets back. And that was very, very important to me. And to the staff. And so through that commitment and the putting, digitizing all of those photographs, it also was self-preservation. I probably need to add that because we were beginning to get all kinds of calls from people who were writing books, documentaries, master's thesis, doctoral dissertations, and they wanted to come and film or do research. Well, these photographs are so important. We are supposed to preserve them to the very best of my ability, and that means not handling them. So it also was a time preservation thing because let's say someone in Boston who was writing a master's thesis would not have to take their spring break or try to come over Christmas holiday or winter holidays to Tulsa and take up our archivist's time in pulling things so that they could do whatever research. We also have eighth graders who were calling us and all. So that was really the best way to make all of the information available. And it, I just cannot stress enough how important it was to not hold anything Now, there was another significant thing that happened, and that was the invitation to a international conference on just governance that's loosely under the United Nations, but it's held in Coast, Switzerland. John um, W. Franklin was the one who put the group together from Tulsa. And I just thought, oh, this will be exciting to go to Switzerland. And And from that moment, we were like, 
what, why are we going? Mm-hmm. What does anybody want to know from us? And then we found out we were one of two featured delegations. Oh, okay. Well, we're Americans. Fine. Whatever. Wait a minute. Who's the other delegation? Well, that's the Turks and the Armenians. The, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're we're going to talk Excuse about that. Excuse me? Yeah. Excuse me? Oh, yes. And there will be Israelis and Palestinians there. And, and we're like, okay, well, we certainly can learn from them. And they're like, no, they really want to learn from you. And we're like, okay, what? What are are you supposed to talk about? And it was finally because someone explained to me that this is just like the Turks and the Armenians. This is just like communities in Africa who have differences and different cultures and um, supremacy of one group over another, et cetera. And we were like, oh, okay. But then Um, so what are the takeaways from it? What do we need to help them? And what they really want to know is how do you talk about difficult history? Oh, that's why we have with us a librarian. We had Alicia Latimer from um, the African-American studies. We had educators. Uh, I was here from there from the historical perspective. There were also some broadcast people. Oh. Oh, that's how you do it. So it was it was a great learning experience for us. We were committed to two years to go and to tell our story, and then um, if you wanted, um, several of us and the group kind of changed a little bit. We went back for two more years, and that was when Moises joined us and uh, Karen Keith, and yeah, it was a, uh, great trips. That that was also. The- which one of those trips is where you got to go to like a theme park? Ah, oh, that's a whole nother story. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know if we want to get into that now. I, I find it an interesting story, but like. <laughs> uh, the golden of, driller. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. You, the, the, let's, let, let's get into the story. Cause I mean, I don't remember all the specific details. I just remember you telling me okay. and it being an amazing story. You realize you've given me an open mic and I could go let's, for <laughs> days. <laughs> Our so, fans okay. don't want to hear from us. So. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I've heard yeah. they actually do like hearing from me. It's oh, the gosh. ear voice Shut they don't up. like. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never forget that. Yeah. All right. Well, this is my favorite subject, so. If you're like me, you might hear estate planning and go, ugh, gross. You might think to yourself, I'm not sure why I'd bother with that. Estate planning is only for the uber rich. Tall grass begs to differ. <laughs> Tallgrass founding attorneys Laurel and Riley think everyone should have an estate plan. They know estate planning seems untouchable to a lot of folks, like something you have to do inside a stuffy law firm of Stuffy McLawyer Pants Esquire. But I promise you, Tallgrass is nothing like that. For one, they work out of their home so their clients can feel at home. They obsess, because they're nerds, over making clients feel like they belong and are supposed to be there. Also, their kids might make an appearance. They will take time to answer all of your questions, even the uncomfortable ones. They will work relentlessly to make sure your plan is exactly what you need to feel secure and at peace. So if you've been putting off planning for what's going to happen after you've gone, it's time for you to give Tallgrass a call at 918-770-8940 and start your plan today. Or visit their website at tallgrassestateplanning.com and schedule a free initial consultation. For free! It's right there on the website. And of course, there's more because this is a podcast ad. If you tell them you're a Pot for Good listener, they're going to take 25% off their service fees. Just tell them Pot for Good sent you. Stop thinking estate planning isn't for you and give Tallgrass a call today at 918-770-8940 or on their website, which I'm not going to read out to you again. It's in our show notes. Thank you, Tallgrass. Okay. So So the Golden Driller. So it was in... February of 2017. Yes, 2017. I was just sitting at my desk, blah, 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 email pops up, and it clearly is someone from France. And of course, I've been through the race massacre. I'm beginning to have conversations with people literally all over the world. And I almost put it in junk mail, but then I thought, oh, I want to see how good their translation is. And it was impeccable. As it turned out, It was a family 
owned amusement park in the northeast corner of France in the Vosges region. And um, this park, Fraspatrie City, um, features the American West, basically. And they were installing a new thrill ride, and they wanted the setting to be an oil field. And they had found on our website and on, on Tulsa's uh, website, we I don't know that we had it then, about our golden driller. And so they wanted three things. Number one, they wanted to know, um, could would we give them permission to build a replica of our golden driller? And I thought, Okay, well, that would be Karen Keith, the county commissioner, check, getting ready to see her at Rotary in a few minutes. And then uh, would I um, write historical panels that would be both in French and English that would tell the story of Tulsa's discovery of oil? Check. Love to do that. What a fun project. And number three, would I come to the inauguration? <laughs> Seriously? I mean, I just fell off. And they would pay for every Really? Okay. So by the time I sent my response, I have looked on the calendar and determined that I am supposed to be in Coast Switzerland on a Monday. And this inauguration is the Friday before. Why, of course I can come. <laughs> and I have already looked on the map to see where... This mm -hmm. amusement park is located, and I've already determined that there is train um, access from that part of France all the way into Co Switzerland. How could I not do this? So um, we worked for several months. It was in uh, the end of June when they would have the inauguration, and um, I talked to Karen Keith. And we decided that, you know, if we're going to that area, we need to explore and see what <laughs> also, how much vacation do you have? How much you have? Oh, great. So let's <laughs> just tell them we're coming for that long. Well, look, longer story shorter is that they provided the most delightful young man named Frederick Beck, who ultimately admits that he's the one that's been doing the translating all the time. And he is basically a consultant for the family-owned park. And um, he carts us around the whole area, and we are treated like royalty. Um, we're just having the most amazing time, and that's a whole nother um, topic that I can spend an hour and a half on. But anyway, at the end of our week of being tourists, and so it's time to come for the inauguration. And also present is Kathy Taylor, former Mayor Kathy Taylor, and her daughter Elizabeth and two grandsons are with us. So in the car, I have asked Frederick, okay, how many people are going to be at the inauguration? And he said, well, we invited 600, but only 500 are coming. <laughs> I knew that the park was closed, that it was a private party, but that, that there was going to be a band. Okay, fine. 500. Okay. <laughs> so then um, we go over to where the the Golden Driller is, and we've already seen it a couple of days before, been introduced to it. And um, they've set up chairs, and there's front row chairs with our names on each chair. Seriously? Uh, okay. And then the park begins to fill with 500 people. <laughs> and most of the, uh, I mean, there's media. So the, we all make remarks. It's lovely, lovely. And um, it was a glorious evening. But at the end of it, they say, okay, we want to take pictures. I kid you not. It was like the Academy Awards with all of the cameras going off and the, and the flash. And it, we, we were just stunned. We had no idea. And oh my word, what a party. What a party. <laughs> uh, best party I've ever been to. But what I did not realize is that they, 
amusement parks are a really big deal in Europe, and they're all over. And people had come from all over Europe to attend this. We met the finest of architects who design amusement parks. We met Lego Germany. Mm, yeah, I have a, just saw a picture of them the other day. Um, we met all of the engineers, all of the landscapers, all of these professional people, um, those who have websites, those who do travel magazines. Da, 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 da. They had every room in this whole region booked <laughs> for these 500 guests. Oh, my word. And this, the cutest country and Western band. I was going to say, what did the, what did the band play? Um <laughs> Country and West, American country and Western <laughs> stuff. Oh and they were so thrilled that we could understand what they were singing. <laughs> yeah. Better than some American bands. Yeah. Again, the benefit of having a train system that goes everywhere is that people can come from other countries. Yeah, we yes. rode we rode like this bullet train. Yeah. It took us two hours to mm-hmm. get from Paris all across mm-hmm. France. Yeah. yeah. It I mean, I feel like it should be a strike against American pride that Europeans can do that and we can't. I feel like that's the angle we should we should go with uh, yeah. to convince people that trains are a good idea. I like it. Um, did you ride the ride? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Now, it's a little bit beyond me how many, I don't remember exactly how many, you know, meters or feet that it is, but there are four different ways to ride it. Um, and there are four carriages on each side, and so you get belted into them and then... Um, You go up and it's out of the way they built the set was out of a storage tank, you know, and there's um, a derrick over there on the side and then this tall tower thing and you go all the way to the top. You can either sit and be buckled in. You can stand straight up. You can stand and lean out and look below you. What's the fourth way? I'll come up with it in a minute. Hang upside down? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not that. It's not that. But anyway, so you get to pick, you know, which one. You have to take off your glasses. If you have sandals on. Um, Do they like shoot you out of a thing like oil coming out of the No, of the- no, <laughs> no. You go up, ah. up. And when you get to the top, it's this magnificent view of the um, Vosges Valley. The Vosges River is right next to the park. And before you know it, it's like all of a sudden, pew, <laughs> and you, it takes you like six seconds to get all the way down. It's the longest six seconds. You've, oh, yeah. Um, ever yeah. Done. But oh, anyway. So it's, it, so it's not a roller coaster. It's like a, it's. No, it's a, it's a, a straight uh, drop. Wow. They do have a roller coaster and it's one that will turn you upside down. Yeah. Yeah. Moises loved it. <laughs> yeah. What, what was it named after? Um, Was that the one that is the. Beaver. No, it's like the Redwood Forest. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My favorite probably was the bumper cars that were little buffaloes and they had oh, wow. little horns on That's them great. and all that. Yeah, that was great fun. I mean, like, so we're talking about history and like a fascinating conversation is like how other countries view other countries' history. And like, this is a very, I mean, France has its own issues with its own history, but like how they view, like how they're, in a way, sort of celebrating certain parts of American history and how they do it is very interesting to me. Cause... Yeah, yeah. And to say that it's commercialized at this um, park, uh, well, they serve barbecue and hot dogs and hamburgers and things. And the little mascots, um, they're a cowboy and a cowgirl. You know, she has blonde braids and all. Um, so it's it's really amusing, but people are just taken with it. And they are having extraordinary, they had a difficult time too during COVID and had to shut down. It was really awful. But they're only open um, after our, like through June, July, and August and then September, they're weekends only. So you only have a short amount of time. And what I'm doing is looking around at the amount of money that they have invested in this amazing little park. And um, when we were leaving, um, the owner, the patriarch of the family, of course, we were all saying our goodbyes and thank you very much. And, you know, I hope we see each other again soon. And it was like, thank you for it. And he said, I don't think you understand. And I'm like, well, understand what? And he said, until Tulsa, Oklahoma bought in to what we were doing, he said, 
we we were getting no interest from the media, from the government, from the locals, anything. But when Tulsa backed it and said that they would come and be here, then suddenly the doors opened for them. So I think that's really um, amazing that, you know, a, a town in the middle of the United States that so many people think is a nowhere, um, nothing place and don't even know where to find it on the map and think we have teepees and buffalo roaming, you know, in the streets, to have that kind of impact on a small community a small business globally. And and then the money that changed hands that went to pay all of the vendors who designed it to think that we had that kind of impact is um, extra value. That's really cool. I mean, do you think it's because it it helped lend some authenticity and right. credibility to exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I, I imagine the press there played into the story of like the Statue of Liberty and how like there's a replica of the Statue of Liberty in Paris. And and, and we got to go see it. Frederick took us to that um, little village and we got to see it. We also got to go to Epinal, which was the center of printing for that part of Europe. And um, we got to see the very first map that was drawn up the Americas. Uh, he he Frederick had made all of these arrangements and we we it's a surprise we don't know what we're in for mm-hmm. and we see this museum that looks pretty hard i mean contemporary concrete you know not great architecture like the rest of europe and so we go in and frederick speaks in french to the receptionist and then turns around to us with this huge smile on his face and he's just like He's trembling with excitement. And so the executive director and archivist come in and meet us, and we go down the elevator. Okay, where are we going? What are Mm -hmm. we doing? And she steps over and opens four deadbolts. Four. And ushers us in, and there are artifacts that are around. And she says in great English, you are here to see the very first map of the Americas. And she pointed to it up on the wall. And we were astounded. I mean, we couldn't believe that we were in the presence of such a thing. And then after we kind of got over that, she said, now, if you turn around, there's a Gutenberg Bible right behind what? you. <laughs> wow. Wow. Was it in, how big of a glass case was it? <laughs> um, okay. How big is this since we're not on That's video? Like three feet? Three feet by... So like a three feet by three feet. Yeah, box. probably three. Yeah. And then it was on a pedestal yep, yep. and it was open to the Psalms <laughs> and the beautiful artwork yeah. that was at the beginning of each chapter. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah so, you but, know, yeah. just because you answer an email one day. Mm-hmm. Um, so be careful what you put in junk email. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's a note to me to read all my emails. Yeah. Well, and I did have conversations with the family about what would you have done if you wouldn't have heard back from us? And what was that like when you hit send? And they said that they all were standing over the computer watching (laughs) it as Frederick hit the send button. And then the fact that I responded within 10 or 15 minutes, um, they were just over the moon because everything hinged on it. Um, so now anyway. so re- a replica question real quick, like the exact same size as the golden driller or like, no, no, it's about, um, a third okay. the size. Yeah. 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 Cause that would be really big. It would be, it would be, but like, <laughs> yeah. it still seems like it'd be less h- tall than the, than the ride itself. So I didn't know how big of a golden driller they would make. So I don't know how tall the actual golden driller is. It seems like the expo center is taller than it. So anyway. You know, I don't remember numbers. That's, That's one of my. I'm gonna find one of those GoPro videos of someone riding this ride and like put it in the show notes. Yeah, well, <laughs> they they do. They have lots on their website. Yeah, so it's F R A I S P E R T U I S City dot com. I think. Listen, you got the hard part, uh, which was spelling all that and remembering yeah, it. Yeah, so. Yeah. Well, I'm sure if you Google French golden driller, you're going to get there. But yeah, they had these videographers who documented everything. And 
They were delightful. We just fell in love with them. And guess who's come to Tulsa to see us? Those videographers. Talked a lot about horrible history. I'm curious, what's some, maybe some little known tidbit or story or person that's maybe a little bit more positive than than something? Okay, Okay. well, I, um, yes, thank you. Uh, It came to me. Jane Hurd Clinton is my hero. And she is the one that I believe is truly responsible for Tulsa's commitment to arts and culture. Now, Uh, She was raised in northern Georgia. Um, She was a Southern Belle of the textbook description of what a Southern Belle ought to be. And her family was very much involved in politics, both local and state and on the national level. And what was unusual about her family was that she and her siblings were encouraged to participate in conversations around the table, okay, instead of being fed and sent to the nursery. So very different there. Um, Her family goes to a local college to see a Shakespeare play, and she falls in love with the lead actor from the audience and finagles getting to meet him. His name is Fred Seavers Clinton, who was a blonde, blue-eyed, Creek Indian from Red Fork Indian Territory, okay? And he wants to be a doctor, a physician. So he has education. He goes uh, still to do. He goes to Kansas City, completes that, comes back and marries his love of his life, and they come to Indian Territory. This is in the late 1880s. Dirt streets, clapboard buildings, outlaws, and um, What she realizes is that she misses the culture, the music, um, the quest for learning. And so she gathers up the other women in the community, and they begin to form clubs, many different ones. And so still today, we benefit from um, Haichka, which was the first music club, Haichka being a Creek word for music. Uh, It's still thriving today. It still gives music scholarships to music students. During the early part of the 20th century, this club would bring into Tulsa the cream of the crop, the top rung of artists, musicians, ballet companies, opera companies. There's a wonderful story in Dr. John Hope Franklin's book about Mirror to America about when he fell in love with opera, and that's a great little story to read. Then the list goes on and on at Convention Hall. Then she and others started the Ruskin Art Club, which is still going today through Philbrook, and it was an art study club, and they even formed a rental service so you could have this particular painting in your home for six months or whatever. And then that really went away when artists began to have galleries here in Tulsa and could sell their own works. Then she also started my favorite, the Tuesday Book Club, which was an intellectual club. It was limited to 25 members. They had lots and lots of rules, 25 members so that they could meet in homes. Mm -hmm. You could only serve coffee and water or maybe tea and water and two types of cookies because they didn't want it to be outdoing the hostesses. It was intellectual and stunning. They'd call the role. You had to answer with a quotation. If you didn't come prepared, then you had to pay a fine and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, it is serious stuff and it is still going today. And so when I retire, I so hope that I'm invited to be in the Tuesday Book Club. Now, Dr. Clinton um, started the first Red Cross. Um, He started what becomes Hillcrest Nursing School. um, And together they started the PTAs. They also were pillars of the Boston Avenue Church community, served on the building Um committees, and she was the church organist for a long time, taught Sunday school, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I really believe that Jane Hurd Clinton gets overlooked Mm -hmm. 
often by Dr. Fred Clinton, who also did remarkable things, and the two of them together were amazing. So that's really cool. Yeah, that's why I love history. It's the things like that, like things you will not get in a history textbook, and that you have to you have to sort of find. Right? Oh, here's one of my other favorite um, things about the Tuesday Book Club: the powers that be in Tulsa, which means the men wanted water for their horses and their dogs. And they were like, wait a minute, what about potable water for the women or, or for the humans? Yeah. <laughs> and all. Sorry, sorry. I didn't yeah. tell that story quite well. But anyway, they made, they stopped the guys and said, hang on, <laughs> you know. So. Cared more about the the dogs and the horses than right. for themselves right. and other humans. Yeah, our yeah. listeners can't tell, but I have my not shocked face on. There. <laughs> yeah. um, but well, Michelle, thank you. Yes, thank my you. pleasure. Yeah. My and, pleasure. Uh, maybe once more before you retire, we we'll, we will have you on again, and we can talk more about these sort of the 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 history. Even people who are interested in don't know about Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Ah, Oklahoma those little General. hidden yeah. fun facts. Yeah. yeah. The, the people who are like fighting to do good here, which is kind of the point of this podcast, who, because of all the other things that have happened here, we don't necessarily get to talk about as often. Right. So. Yeah. And I love those behind the scenes, quiet people mm -hmm. um, who do so much for our community. Thank you for listening to our episode with Michelle. If you have not been to the THSM, as we call it for short, please go. It is one, it's a beautiful building. Two, they have some really cool exhibits uh, that we didn't even get a chance to talk with her about. Like they had a great TCC exhibit a while ago that's gone now that I thought was really cool. Go. It doesn't cost a lot. It is worthwhile. It is a Tulsa, I wouldn't say hidden gem. It's a gem that more people should go to. Pod for Good is, of course, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So please subscribe, leave a review. Tell other people you're listening. Buy a shirt. We have shirts. I'll post about them eventually. Uh, as always, Broken Arrow, I don't know what you've done recently, but I know it's terrible. Tulsa, get it done. Stay safe out there. <laughs>